Hey. Hello. Hey. Calling. calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London for two shows running. It's just kind of a record, unfortunately. Yeah, calling I think Rick it Byer. may actually be a record. <laughs> calling Rick Byer in. It looks like Chicago. I am here in Chicago. Wow. Chris, I noticed that you were out for curry the other day when you I came was. across this. Yeah. That's and we're looking that's, at a picture of Chris in front of a burger joint called Band of Burgers, which is just wrong in so many ways. Wrong on many counts. Did you go <laughs> in and lay waste? No, now it's I kind of regret it because I I, and I have the sneaking suspicion there'd be like a Winter's Burger and Garnier fries or something, but I I, I didn't. No. I think you right. I think you need to go in and do that at some mm, point. You need to feel a full one. report to everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah. We want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, which we are not going to rename Band of Burgers, uh, brought to <laughs> yeah. you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And whether you're watching live or catching us uh, uh, after the fact, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, and today our topic is going to be the first Vietnam War, the one before the one that we were in, uh, uh, from uh, 1945 to 1954, Vietnam versus France. But Chris, we also have a special reveal we at do. the top of today's show does that is it two drum rolls then for the show or you're just well, going like, to hit the we button we can't do two drum rolls that would all right be, so I just hit the button wrong. but we'll just yep. say that ladies and gentlemen there now exists in the universe there you go. And everybody needs one hats and everybody yes. needs one and I, i'm going to put yeah. mine on and it's going to i wish i could put mine on why why can't i, I put mine on rick so, there you go history happy hour hat uh, there you go and check out the oh, wrong I, side. <laughs> Check out yeah. website on the side. Now you might wonder how you can get one of these bad boys. You're nice. You're and right. uh, one way is to become a five-time guest. Might be okay. a high bar for some yep. of you, but yep. um, five-time guests, we're going to give them a hat. Uh, a second way would be to join us as a top shelf patron on patreon.com. If you are already a top shelf patron, you should have gotten an email about your hat. If you're not, hey, just go to patreon.com, upgrade to a top shelf or, or become a patron. And um, this is a brash, you know, bald marketing bald. fundraising yes, move. Bald. No <laughs> subtlety here involved whatsoever. <laughs> um, and, uh, but you can get your hat by uh, becoming a top shelf patron at patreon.com. And then we insist that you wear it and send us a picture of yourself in it. Um, Oh my gosh, Chris! Is anybody watching? Uh, what we're I doing we all this self promotion watching, and yes. fundraising and whatever yeah. we're doing? Who's yeah. out there? David from Philadelphia and uh, Lynn from Vermont, uh, Doug from uh, Exton, PA, and Nancy from uh, deep in the heart of Texas. So, Xavier yeah. from Barcelona. Yeah, we have our. Well, we can't start without Xavier. That's kind of. Horrible. I know we can't start without Xavier, and we got lots of other folks here too. Please, guys, uh, let us know what you're drinking today, what your cocktail is, and Chris, why don't you get us started on uh, on uh, on moving forward and getting out of this part of the, of the program <laughs> well i think we should probably talk about our guest and uh well our, i think our... we should run our open first oh well yeah it's always helpful right? yeah The bar, the bar is, now is open, and now you can talk. Now about I can our talk guest. about our guest. Yes. Well, our guest uh, this week is Christopher Gosha, and he is a professor of international relations in the history department at the University du Quebec à Montreal. He's a leading expert on the Cold War in Asia and the wars in Vietnam, and his books include Vietnam: A New History. And he lives in Montreal, where we're told it's very snowy. Hey, Chris, how are hey, you doing? Hey, Chris, how are you? Hey, I'm doing well. I'm doing Welcome. very well. Thank you very much. And, you know, I'm required by by uh, by History Happy Hour precedent to ask you if you've brought a cocktail with you today. I have brought a, a little. I'm in my I'm in my office here, so uh, we can't bring cocktails in here. I'm totally uh -huh. for the idea of having a cocktail, but I do have a, a little bit of a Coke here in, in, until I can get to a cocktail when I get home a little bit later. So if there's anybody from the university watching that is, in fact, a Coke and not anything else. So. That, is, that is at least what we've been told. Yes. And Chris, <laughs> that's, that's Chris, that's what, right. what have you got, Chris? I have, I have a, a Cobra 
which mm. is, is left over from the curry that I had last night when I bumped into that unfortunate burger joint. So. Oh, ooh, that's <laughs> awkward. And I have an escapist uh, IPA because oh, this whole nice. show is an exercise in escapism. But before we pummel Chris with questions, we should just mention that his new book is called The Road to Dien Bien Phu, which, of course, was the showdown battle between the Vietnamese and the French in 1954. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Mr. Anderson, start us off. Yeah, well, you know, um, uh, before the show, we were all talking. And, and as some of you who are watching know, my daughter Madeline went to, to a French school. And I remember uh, one day after school, she came home and she was talking about um, Vietnam and uh she, we were talking about America's war in Vietnam, uh, and I mentioned, well, you know, the French were there too, and uh, she was really surprised by this. And I said, well, you go to a French school, why don't they tell you about this in your French school? And she didn't have a good answer. So, Christopher, maybe you could tell us just, you know, for the edification of my daughter, uh, what are the French doing in Vietnam? Yeah, well, I would say that as, as we were saying a little bit before we got started, the, the Indochina War from 1945 to 54 for the French, you know, between the French and the Vietnamese is still something of a, of a black hole in France. Um, the French write a lot. They're very interested in the Algerian War, which was the, the war after the, the first Indochina War from 1954 to 1962. Um, but it's a it's a black hole. Um, so um, I've worked on this this war in French and then in particular here in English uh, in the book that you have here. Um, I would say the other thing about what your daughter said, she has kind of one foot in the French world there. And I think she's yeah. right. it's a black hole. I think she has one foot maybe in the American world. I think you both of you would agree with me and our guests as well. Uh, the Vietnam War dominates. It, yeah. it dominates in the number of books that are produced. It dominates uh, the films, the books, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing, uh, the way Hollywood's presented it. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard. So I guess that, that first Indochina war, the French war, if you will, kind of gets lost and, and kind of, uh, garbled up and swallowed up by the, the American war. Yeah. Uh, Chris, maybe you can, uh, give us a little, uh, following up on, on I have two Chris's today, so yeah, it's gonna be a little. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to distinguish. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it probably can. <laughs> I, I, I know Chris, that you're a renowned and respected scholar in this area. And Chris, I'm talking about our guest, not. Yes. Yeah, so, and the other Chris is not. So okay. that's a good tip off. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you've been working on this book for the last 15 years. Plus yeah. you speak English, uh, English, French, and Vietnamese. You're two languages ahead of two and a half ahead of me. <laughs> um, yeah, and so you've really been able to dive into the primary sources, but start us with historical and geographical context. As Chris, what are the French doing in, in Indochina or in yeah. Indochina, the same thing as Vietnam, but kind of catch us up from sure. the French being there up until about 1945. Yeah, no, you, you've got a good point there. Um, I guess, you know, the 19th century, the the French and the British and the Dutch as well, they were increasingly involved in Southeast Asia and in East Asia. Um, so a lot of your your listeners know uh, that the, the British, they, they took Hong Kong, for example, uh, in 1842. The French were looking to, to get kind of their Hong Kong, if you like. Uh, so they started shopping around, if I could put it that way, in Southeast Asia, uh, and they used um, they used force, they used their navy, and they, they attacked Southern Vietnam. Uh, so if you look at that map there, um, you have the Tonkin, and then you have Annam, and then Cochin, China in the south. All three of those together kind of make the S form of, of Vietnam. And to the west, you have Laos, as you can see, and then you have Cambodia. The map is in, in French, but I think you can you can make it out here. Um, so the French, they attack in the late 1850s in southern Vietnam, Saigon, which you can see uh, down there at the bottom of the map. They're going to attack in the late 1850s. And then in the 1860s, they're going to move in. All of this was just by force uh, moving against the Vietnamese or trying to stop them. Uh, they'll move into Cambodia in the 1860s. They'll colonize. So southern Vietnam or Cochin, China, Cambodia. And then over the course of the next 20 years, for all sorts of political reasons that are kind of linked to what's going on in Europe as well. By the 1880s, uh, they'll conquer central Vietnam and then northern Vietnam. Uh, they'll conquer Hanoi in a, in a, in a battle in the, in the 1880s. Uh, and to make kind of a long story very short, uh, they will combine all of these uh, countries into one colonial state, which they'll call uh, Indochina or French Indochina uh, in 1887. Uh, so that new colonial state, French Indochina, just to 
to, to recap, it'll, it's made up of Vietnam, but Vietnam is divided into three colonial pieces, uh, Cambodia uh, and then Laos as well. I didn't mention it, but they'll add Laos uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So those three main countries, Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam, make up the new colonial state of French Indochina. But, does, but do the people there, do they consider themselves Vietnamese, Cambodians and Laos, Laotians or are they... Uh, and are they one entity or does the French create this entity? Yeah, well, it's 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 a great question. It's a great question. Um, if we back up just a little bit, the Vietnamese in the beginning, Vietnam in the beginning. Uh, Rick, would you mind going back to that map? Would that be possible? Uh, in the Anything beginning for you, Chris. Well, I appreciate that. Um, any in the, in the beginning, way back when. Uh, second century, first century before Christ, and then uh, up until uh, 1000 AD. I, I don't want to go too deep into this, but Vietnam was only that part around Hanoi. So Vietnam was only the northern part. But once the Vietnamese broke away from the Chinese empire uh, in, the, the, in the 10th century, they then will begin to move south and colonize themselves. So they break out from the Chinese empire and then they create their own empire by moving south to Cochin, China, to Saigon. But to answer your question, Chris, for a brief time in the early 19th century, the Vietnamese controlled much of Laos and almost all of Cambodia. So what the Vietnamese created look a lot like what the French are going to take over, if you follow what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so right. this, the reason I, I kind of jump on your question there, if you don't mind, is it's going to create problems <laughs> later right. uh, during the French Indochina War, during the Vietnam War. And in particular, you know, there's the third Indochina War as well with the Khmer Rouge and all of that. But it's linked to this Vietnamese empire that existed before. And then the French will kind of graph their empire onto what the Vietnamese had done before. But it's, 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 um, it's an important point because it's going to cause a lot of problems. Yeah. And they haven't been discussed all that much uh, in the, the scholarship that's been done. But I think the French will, will create the French Indo-Chinese state, which is going to exist from 1887 all the way until 1954. That's what the Vietnamese Ho Chi Minh and his troops are going to bring down. They're going to, they're going to bring down French Indochina, but they're not going to let go of Laos and Cambodia themselves. Okay. <laughs> well, so, so short circuiting a, a bunch of history here. Um, there, there turns out to be a big war in the 1930s and forties that involves yeah. uh, Japan uh, in, in, in the end, uh, 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 basically, although Vichy France is an ally of Japan, then yeah. after de Gaulle takes over, they're not. Yeah. The Japanese uh, imprison all the Vichy French people. When Japan surrenders, Vietnam suddenly discovers itself a little un ungoverned at that point or un uncontrolled. And that's, when, no, and that's right. when Ho Chi Minh and his government... Uh, uh, come in and uh, well, he forms a government. He 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 starts a, a coalition government, yep. a, a, yep. a provisional government in in 1945, and that's really kind of where this whole modern mm -hmm. conflict, modern history starts off, isn't it? Absolutely, no. You 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 summed it up well. I would say if you could go back to those pictures, uh, that's Ho Chi Minh who was opposed to that French Indo Chinese state before 1945. He's a globetrotter. Uh, you know, Mao Zedong didn't really leave China. Ho Chi Minh did. He left in 1911. He's going to go to France. He's going to cross the Atlantic. He'll go to, he'll go to New York. He'll come back to London. He's in Boston for a while. I think. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, uh, so he's a, he's a revolutionary globetrotter, and he's going to convert to communism in Paris after World War One, and that's where, if you look at the that the, the middle, the third from the left, that's him at a meeting of the French Socialist Party, which becomes the it breaks and becomes the French Communist Party. And then he goes to Moscow in 1923. I'm getting back to what you said, Rick, about 1945. But what's interesting is he he's, he circulates on the outside, but he's um, he really reads geopolitics well. And so when the Japanese uh, occupy Indochina and the Americans enter the war uh, after the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in 1941, he knows that the Japanese days are counted, or at least that's the bet that he makes. And it turns out that he's right. And so he hustles back to, to Vietnam in 1941. He creates the Viet Minh. I'm sure some of you maybe have heard of the Viet Minh. It's a nationalist front. Um, he's waiting. He was thrilled when the Japanese finally overthrew 
the, the, the Vichy government uh, and put the, the Vichy troops in jail in, uh, <clears throat> in March of 1945. And then, of course, he was thrilled when the uh, Allies defeated the Japanese. And to get to your point, Rick, that created that vacuum that he needed. Mm -hmm. And that's where Ho Chi Minh put Vietnam back on the map literally um you know so that's the 2nd of september 1945 he's in hanoi uh and he addresses you know 20 30 some people say it's 100 200,000 vietnamese uh, who are thrilled to to have their independence back but of course the problem is is that uh, de gaulle as you said he just got his independence back but he's de determined to reestablish sharing it well, <laughs> he wants yeah he's not sharing it. he wants the french empire back because for france and de Gaulle in particular, 1940 was a very humiliating experience. And for able, in order for de Gaulle, I think, to, to really be among the big powers again, he needs the empire. So he's betting on getting French Indochina back and he's he and he already has Algeria, you know. So he wants those two pillars of the empire so that he can bring France back to kind of great power status. But uh, but our, our you know the, the movement that Ho, Ho Chi Minh will eventually lead. Is that one of several? I mean, what is the what is the kind of what's the environment for independence movements before the war? I mean, is there only one, or are there many different competing groups? Or yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question, Chris. There's um, you have um, kind of communist nationalists, which I think Ho Chi Minh incarnates. Then you have kind of um, social democrats, non-communists. And that was led by the, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party. Um, you have oh, a variety of other of other groups as well. Um, the problem is during the colonial period, you know, up until World War II, up until 1945, uh, the French have a really hard time dealing with these political parties. And to be really honest, and I, I'm not you know saying anything new here. Uh, they put most of these people in jail, and if the, and and those who uh, cause problems, they will they will be executed as well. So this was particularly the case in the early 1930s. There was uprisings in the 1930s, and they were indeed brutally repressed uh, by by the French. And there'll be another one in 1941, and it's it's the same thing. So your question's interesting because in a way they never really created a kind of a reformist or kind of like the Indian Congress, you know. In India, where the British, I'm not saying the British are better colonizers. I don't want to go down that road. But what I am saying is that they were able to create kind of partners with whom they could work. Whereas the French, when they got to 1945, they really didn't have any partners other than the Communist Party. And they found themselves in a, in a bit of a pickle. Um, so that was a that was a. So it was limited partners because of the, the hard handed uh, French policy during the, the 1920s and 30s. I want to stick on Ho Chi Minh for a minute because we sure. have a question from uh, the audience and I'll combine it with a question Absolutely. of mine. But uh, David Picker says, can we talk a bit about the fact that Ho Chi Minh was at mm. the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919 and was ignored? And I would like to add to that, mm -hmm. if you want now or we can come back later, you know, uh, what is it about? What do we most misunderstand about Ho Chi Minh? I mean, this is a this is a person. I grew up in the fifties uh -huh. and sixties. This was a big name. He was the big bad villain of Vietnam. But what right, do we right. what do we misunderstand about him? I mean, it doesn't have to be like that. Oh, he's good and or, or he's bad. But just what what kind of don't we know or don't we realize about this guy? So two questions, David's and mine. Okay, um, they're and, kind of and, linked, and I'm though. a little upset, by the way, that twice you've told Chris he asked a good question and I haven't gotten that yet. But <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in any way. You know, I thought about that. I thought about when I yeah. said that. <laughs> and you know, it's not the first time. Chris. It's not the first time. We know who asked the good questions. It's okay. I'm fine oh, with it. Oh, hey. <sighs> well, I okay, okay. I'm, <laughs> Great question, Rick. I'm, I'm sure you're going to have a great question here. You want... <laughs> One day it'll happen. Just probably not today. <laughs> uh, well, let me get to Versailles here. Yeah. So you're the, you're uh, the viewer. He's it's, it's a great point. I mean, yes, I think Ho Chi Minh's a globetrotter. He, he leaves in 1911. 
Um, and he doesn't leave as a communist. You know, he actually leaves as someone who would like to work with the French, um, someone who would like to reform the French colonial system. Um, he is a, a Democrat, a Republican, you know, in the French tradition. He really does believe that there, there needs to be something similar to what the British were doing with the Indian Congress uh, in, in, in India, for example. Um, he would, he's watching what's going on during World War I. And then he's in the, the halls of Versailles. But I would I, I think your your viewers may or may not know, but um, he, there was others there. There was Chinese nationalists there, communists, non-communists. There was Algerians there. There's a really interesting group of people who uh, Egyptians were there as well, who were hoping that after this war, given that they had participated in the war as well, the, the colonial troops that the, the British, the French, and the Americans would do something. And as um, as I think the viewer said, uh, Ho Chi Minh would be disappointed. Uh, he would write to the French. He would write to Woodrow Wilson, you know, hoping that Wilson would make good on, uh, you know, self-determination and that sort of thing. But in the end, I think you you know, is that uh, decolonization was limited to the, the Habsburg uh, Empire, if you like. And, and not to the, the Franco or the French or the British empires. So, yeah, disappointment. There's no doubt about it. There, there's great disappointment. And um, so Ho Chi Minh will then uh, look to other possibilities when it comes to national liberation. Now, communism was one. He chose that one. He did. And there's no denying that. And he will go down the communist uh, track, as I explained in my, my book, all the way to 1954 and after. Uh, there was other possibilities as well. So you have other people who were at Versailles, Egyptians, for example, who are going to try to go down the Republican route and that sort of thing. But it is true that Ho was very disappointed uh, by Wilson, but by the French in particular. And um, that's when he will create the uh, Indo-Chinese Communist Party, also known as the Vietnamese Communist Party. Uh, Chris, there's this confusion again, always between Indochina and Vietnam, but yeah. I don't want to go too far down that road because it gets a little confusing. But he creates the Vietnamese slash into the Chinese Communist Party in 1930, and then he'll create the, the Viet Minh uh, in 1941. And then we get to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which is the new nation state he creates on the 2nd of September uh, 1945. So it is a remarkable person, uh, Rick, to get back to what you said. There's no doubt about him. I think you're right. Love him or hate him, you know, <laughs> love him or hate him. Uh, this is someone who was, um, uh, you know, who, who, was, who was quite remarkable, quite brilliant, um, and who would uh, lead Vietnam to independence in 1954 and then even further uh, in the end. For me to answer your question, which, by the way, was a very good question. <laughs> 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 Thanks, man. Um, I would I'll just take say, that as a totally objective, unforced absolutely, comment. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, the thing is, what strikes me, and I, I have to deal when I, you know, I kind of write about Vietnam, you always have to deal with Ho Chi Minh. Was he a villain or was he a saint? Well, you know, um, neither one or the other, right? But one of the things that strikes me, two things, was his ability to create networks. Um, that whole time he was on the outside from 1911 all the way until 1941, uh, he, he, he had this uncanny ability to create networks, to never burn bridges. He, he, he learned languages, which means, you know, how to build networks. You know what I mean? If you were, so he knew Russian, he knew Chinese, he knew French, he spoke English quite well. He even learned Thai. This is all a reflection of him traveling, but he, he always had, you know, kind of a, an address book, which was quite remarkable. Um, yeah, that, 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 you know, so he knew he met Mao Zedong, he knew Stalin, but he knew also kind of, how would I put this, not in a pejorative way, but people he would bump into in ports that he was going through in Bangkok or Singapore or in Southern China. And he would be able to rely upon these things later on when he's fighting the French and the Americans. It's absolutely extraordinary. The, the address book that he was able to put together. Um, so that's something that I tried to bring out in my book. And I don't think we talk about enough is that that ability to, to do that. Um, the other thing, too, is he could read geopolitics. And, um, you know, he he really knew where he needed to be at the right time and what he had to do. Um, he and when I say networking, too, if you take the example of World War Two, he knew that he needed to work with the American OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, 
uh, and he knew that he was he needed to be the man who could get in there, work with the Americans, find the pilots that were shot down by the Japanese in Indochina, you know, from 1941 to, to 1945 and all that. Uh, but he knew that he would get access to radios, you know, and I have a chapter in my book about radios. But, oh, I, you know, he I get, I get to this idea of networking and, and radios now, but he he was able to tune himself in, if I can put it that way. He was able to he something of a technology geek, you know, as well. But when he took power in August of September of 1945, not only did he make the bet that the Japanese would lose and they did, but he needed to know exactly when he should go into Hanoi. And he had access to American provided radios. You know what I mean? And I, I don't know if I'm going a little bit off on your question there, but there's these little things about Ho that make him really unique. Was he a communist? Yes. Was he a nationalist? Yes. You know what I mean? It, it, was it important? Of course it was. Did he do you know bad things? Yes, he did. Did he do good things? Yes. But there's another level to it. And I'm kind of getting on your question there. There's another level that really makes him stand out. And it's this networking, tuning in, both literal, you know, human networking and then literally technology. And, and that's something I talk about in the book as well, is, is how he wired the, the Indochina war to, to a certain extent from the beginning. So, so Christopher, when, when he, you know, kind of picking up on what, on Ho, when he declares yeah. the Republic, you know, what's, what's the international reaction and, and is it, is it actually, is he actually creating a government or, I mean, to use probably a bad analogy, is it like, you know, the Irish during the uprising in 1916 saying, no. we're a republic, but nobody actually. <laughs> well, I mean, there's always a little bit, isn't there, of that, you know, when you when you take over, you know, after, uh, when an empire falls, right. and, you know, there's always you got to pick up the pieces and try to put it back together in the form of a nation state or in the form of something else as quickly as possible. But um, yeah, he had that opening, that window. And when he right. got there, he moved fast. And and what did he do? I think he did what a lot of nationalists did, like in, you know, Sukarno in Indonesia as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he immediately, you know, grafted the nation state, even though it could have been fictitious in many ways, straight onto the pre-existing colonial state. You know, so so what was working as a colonial state three days earlier or a couple of months earlier? Well, he was taking over. But of course, he would make the argument. This was mine before yours in the 19th century. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it, but it, I mean, he had another French are coming back. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, geopolitics. I totally agree with you. Yeah. He knew. He knew. He knew. And uh, so he knew he had that opening there. Right. And he knew that de Gaulle was going to want the, the, the empire back. Um, he also knew that real quick, perhaps for 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 our viewers, that. At the end of World War II, Truman decided to divide Vietnam into two occupation uh, zones. And um, Ho took power in all of Vietnam. But the problem is Ho knew that Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist Chinese would occupy and accept the Japanese surrender north of the 16th parallel, whereas the British would do the same thing below the 16th parallel. So to get to your, your point there, would, uh, he had to deal with the British in the north, I'm sorry, the British in the South, the Chinese in the North, the Americans, they're kind of moving up and down. They're saying, what's going on here? You know, trying to find out who Ho is. And then the French are doing everything they can to get back in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's an incredibly complicated time mm -hmm. in 1945 and 46. But to boil it down to something simple, uh, there's two nation states that clash uh, in, in 1945 and 1946. It's Ho's nation state born out of World War II. And it's the French don't like it when I say this, but it's it's de Gaulle's. It's the new nation state born out of the Allied liberation of France in 1944. And those two clash because the French, the empire is a part of the French nation. Whereas for Ho Chi Minh, sorry, this was ours before it was yours and we want it back now. War breaks out on the 19th of December, 1946. And it's going to be a bloody war until its end at Dien Bien Phu on the, on the 7th of May, 1954. So one of the things that um, you talk about in the book is that this war starts, and it's mostly at the beginning, a, a kind of a guerrilla war. Yes. But things change. How and why do things change around 1949, a few years yeah. into this war? No, you're totally right. I think the the first half between 1945 and 1949, 1950, it's it's what I call the the tiger against the the elephant, or actually what Ho Chi Minh called the the battle of the tiger against the elephant. It's the the tiger fights a guerrilla war. Uh, the elephant is the modern French army 
uh, with artillery, great firepower and that sort of thing. And so the tiger, as Ho Chi Minh told it to an American journalist in Paris just before the war broke out in 1946, the tiger attacks uh, at night. It jumps on the elephant's back, but it never takes it on in, in conventional warfare or set piece battle. So that was the type of war that was fought uh, in Vietnam between 1945 and 1950. Um, as you say, uh, Rick, everything changes in 1949 when uh, Mao Zedong, the Chinese communists, come to power in China. And China, of course, borders with northern Vietnam. And that's where Ho's capital is after uh, he's pushed out by the, by the French from Hanoi and Saigon uh, when the war starts in 1946. Um, but that's a big, big change uh, geopolitically when the Chinese communists take power because Mao Zedong's going to throw his diplomatic weight. He's going to throw his military weight. He's going to throw his economic weight behind uh, Ho Chi Minh at the same time that he's helping Kim Il-sung in North Korea against the Americans uh, who are fighting them directly uh, in, in South Korea. So and again, I get back to networking, but Ho Chi Minh knew Mao Zedong. Ho Chi Minh knew his... Uh, right-hand man, the Minister of uh, Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, Zhou Enlai. Uh, he knew them from the 1920s and he knew them from the 1930s. It paid off. It paid off in a big way. So Mao Zedong recognized the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, in 1950. He provided it modern military aid, artillery. Uh, eventually, he's going to provide um, anti-aircraft uh, systems, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so this allows, I'm getting to your, your point now, this allows the tiger to become something different. And I think this is what's really unique and it's something that I try to show in the book is that uh, the Indochina war, it's not just counterinsurgency. It's not just pacification. It's not just a guerrilla war. It becomes a conventional war. And no other war of decolonization in the 20th century duplicates this military revolution that occurs from 1950. So the Vietnamese army, which is led by the famous General Vo Nguyen Giap, uh, he is going to put together a divisional army. So it's not a, a motley crew. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It's not, you know, the, the tiger. But now it's becoming an elephant, meaning seven divisions. The Vietnamese create an army with seven divisions, including an artillery division by the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. So it's it's a military revolution like none other than that, that we've seen. And you'll have eight set piece battles between 1950 and 1954. I won't name them all here, but the first battle is the border battle of uh, Cao Bang in, um, let's just say, late 1950. It opens the it opens the uh, the road to to China. It opens the road to kind of all the way to the Soviet Union in a way. So Vietnam is really connected to the the communist world uh, from that day, from that 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 year of 1950. So yeah, you're you're right, Rick. It's it's an important point. It's um, it's a very very important transitional moment in the war, and I just would emphasize that that's it's not that the Vietnamese are more nationalist than like say the the Algerian nationalists, do you understand what I mean? Or the Indonesians who are fighting the Dutch? It's because there's this conjuncture which allows them to have access to this uh, assistance, to models, and to, and to aid. I mean, it would be like saying, uh, who? I would never, you know, the Ukrainians are fighting impressively. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, whatever your politics might be. But they also have access to a Polish road, which leads them to large amounts of weapons coming from the British, the Americans. So you have something similar that's going on. Whereas in Algeria, during the war against the French, I don't want to minimize Egypt, but they just didn't have that massive amount of weapons uh, that they could provide to the Algerians. And the same goes for the Indonesians who were fighting uh, the Dutch. So that's a really long answer to your 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 question there. I'm sorry about that. But, but it's I guess I wanted to use it to, to show that there's something really unique going on in military history here that we don't see in other wars of decolonization and not even in the ISIS in Afghanistan as well. I don't think the Taliban put together a divisional army with six divisions that was able to fight a DM. I don't think there's been anywhere else, to my knowledge, a DMB in full, uh, except in Vietnam. But of course, we could talk about Korea and we could talk about the Sino-Japanese war if you like. But my point is, it's a very unique war of decolonization. Well, Christopher, I want to I want to get back to the evolution of the Vietnamese Vietnamese forces. But before I do, I, I yep. do want to, there's another side in all of this war. And, and 
a couple of things I'd like to ask you about about the French, and and one is, why did they think that? Well, well, what was their overall strategy? Because it seems to me that you know, given the state of France in 1945, they should have realized pretty quickly that this was only going to end one way. But they 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 do- adopt a very different colonial policy than to say Britain or the Dutch. So so maybe talk about that a bit, and then. Um, you know, kind of what their overarching strategy is, because one of the things that struck me about the book was um, just how incredibly brutal yeah. this war was. I mean, it sounds silly to say this, but when you read it, it I know. much, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that historians haven't answered that question correctly yet, in my opinion. Right. Uh, this is something that a lot of us have been working on, both for the French colonial period, say from the late 19th century all the way until 1954, even till the end of the Algerian War. Um, you know, and why were, why did they not seem to have a, a, a strategy, an end game for some sort of a reformist type of independence? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Uh, rather than going down a brutal war, first in Indochina and then in Algeria, a lot of us are scratching our heads. Well, like you say, what is going on in the French mind uh, that they're incapable, whether it be on the left or on the right? I mean, e- even at least the Socialist Party on the left was as involved in this uh, as much as the the Gaullist and those on the right as well. Um, I think there's a there's a couple things going on here. Charles de Gaulle, first of all, um, we talked about a little bit before the show, but I think he really wanted the empire back. He needed the empire. Mm-hmm. for uh, economic reconstruction of France, which had been bombed and, and devastated but during World War II, uh, access to the rubber plantations in, in, in Cochin, China, as a way of getting American dollars and all sorts of things they could sell, you know, and then reinvest. Uh, prestige, I don't, we, I don't think we should underestimate that. Uh, 1940 was really humiliating, and I can understand. Um, that was that was a, a very tough moment for uh, the French and for de Gaulle in particular. So he saw the recuperation of the empire as a way of getting back in the great power game. And I, and I, I, I think that was, that was incredibly important for uh, Charles de Gaulle. Uh, he had to, he had to have that back. He wanted to be, to get back, uh, to get France back among the great powers. Um, maybe one last point would be Vichy was a problem in, this is interesting something I'm kind of working on is that the Japanese overthrew most of the, the empires in Southeast Asia, right? When they attacked the Americans at Pearl Harbor, then they looked towards the South. They overthrew the Americans in the Philippines. They overthrew the Dutch in Indonesia. They overthrew the British in Singapore, <clears throat> Burma, Malaya, right? We all agree on that. They left the French in. This is interesting. Even though they threw the French out at the end of the war, March of 45, you never had a turnover among the French political class in Indochina. So a lot of those colonial administrators, I don't want to go too deep into this, but unlike what happened in Burma, unlike what happened in Malaysia, unlike what happened even in the American Philippines, is that they got caught in a time warp and they kind of convinced themselves, we can deal with this like we did in the 1930s, like I told you before. Uh, All we have to do is come back the Vietnamese, I can give you all sorts of, you know, quotes and stuff, but we just need to put them back in their place and everything will be fine. So I, I get to your, your your questions there is that they walked in thinking both De Gaulle on one side, because he's the one who said, take it back by force if you have to. So he started the long Indo-Algerian war, to be quite honest. And then he brought back all of these administrators as a, un, unlike the British who kind of brought in new blood. They said, whoa, the times have changed. You should have seen what happened in Europe. You should have seen what happened in, you know, in China. Whereas in Indochina, there was kind of this time warp. I don't know quite how to explain it. And I think that that didn't help the French out in coming up with a new policy instead of, you know, going into this brutal war of decolonization. But Chris, don't forget that right after the Indochina, you know, DMB and Fu fell, Geneva, you know, was the ceasefire. It ended the first Indochina war. The French marched off to Algeria and it wasn't to fight communists. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the things that's kind of interesting to me in this war, this is 
the the French have started out what is essentially a colonial war. Mm -hmm. It becomes it starts to become viewed, at least in some places like Washington D.C., as mm -hmm. an anti-communist war. So, to how, how is America? Is America, the United States of America, involved in this war at all? Absolutely up before Dien Bien Phu. Absolutely. It's it's the flip side of what you asked a moment ago, uh, Rick. Uh, when the Chinese came in, it, it, it transformed the war for Ho Chi Minh. Uh, but um, when the Chinese came in, it also transformed the war for the, the Americans. Uh, the Americans were kind of standoffish. You know, they kept advising the French. It's like, you know, you might want to think about decolonization. You know what I mean? Um, you know, if, if we could do it in the Philippines, you can do it. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, but once the, the, the Chinese came, the Korean War broke out in June of 1950, uh, the Americans reinterpreted the, the colonial war as an integral part of their containment policy uh, for stopping the Chinese in particular, uh, the Soviets behind them. Uh, it's the domino theory. But um, I would say one thing, too, that I try to show in the book is that the Americans, you have to understand, too, that, um, you know, the presidents who are going to be involved in Vietnam, uh, Lyndon Johnson, John F. Kennedy, they were in the Pacific War during World War II. And they saw what the Japanese did when they marched all the way from China to Singapore, Burma. So in the American mind, when China goes communist, if I can put it that way, when Mao Zedong comes to power and he, you know, he supports Kim Il-sung, he supports Ho Chi Minh. They see this as a threat to um, the American Pacific, if I can put it that way, the American lake, American interest, uh, uh, because they are the number one power after World War II. And so to make a long story short, the Americans become deeply involved in, in the Indochina war. I, I make the argument in my book and elsewhere and elsewhere, excuse me that um, the, the American war begins in 1950. I'm not the only one to say that, but they begin fighting an indirect war through the French now against the, the communists. So it's, it's quite interesting, in my opinion, they're fighting an Indo-Korean war. They're fighting directly against the Chinese and the North Koreans in Korea, and they're fighting indirectly uh, through the French against Ho Chi Minh. And the Chinese are doing something very similar. They don't want to take on the Americans at the same time in two fronts. Uh, in Indochina and Korea. So the Chinese are th are thrilled, if I can put it that way, or they're, it's in their interest to create a divisional army uh, that's capable of taking on the French. So the, the, the French-Indochina war becomes a, a Franco-American war from 1950. The French don't like to, to think of it that way, but they, they knew it at the time. And someone like General Delattre, he knew it perfectly when he went uh, in 1951 to, to ask for aid military assistance um, from Truman and, um, you know, uh, for the Indochina War in 1951. Napalm, that's where napalm came from. Delat was the first to use napalm um, in 1950, but in particular during the big battles, big, big battles close to Hanoi, because he was afraid that they were they were going to do what was going on in Korea and that maybe the Jap and Ho Chi Minh and the, the army would take North Vietnam. So the Vietnam War, the first Vietnam War becomes an American war, if I can put it that way, before the American Vietnam War, if you see what I mean. So it's a long war. It's a very long war. But this shows the importance of Vietnam from 1950 until the end of the 20th century, at least. So, um, uh, Rick, do you want to ask, want me to ask a question or you want to bring one in? Oh, good. Well, you can either ask a question or... Well, yeah, one question in. I have since you know, sure. we're, we're starting to talk about the war, you know, you have lots and lots of to unpack in the book. Um, but one of the terms you refer to that I found really fascinating was war communism. Yeah. What is war communism? And is that different than communism? And if so, how? Yeah. This is something that I'm one of the arguments that I make uh, in the book is that this is a specific type of warfare that develops uh, kind of in military history in the 20th century. I know that's a big thing to say. Um, but if you look at what's going on in the Soviet Union first, then in China, uh, and then in Vietnam and Korea, something unique is going on. And I try to, in the book, I try to find out what it is that allows uh, these countries that are driven by, com that are run by communist parties to create such modern force, 
divisional armies use artillery, uh, mobilize in po a population, just tens of thousands of people in order to do that, which is something that you just do not see in Algeria, Indonesia, uh, the Afghanistan war, I'm sorry, it is not the same. So I'm, I, I was trying to understand what is it that makes these communist states so lethal? Uh, you know, with the, the Chinese Communist Party did it. They, they fought the Japanese, of course, with Chiang Kai-shek. I would never deny that. But then they defeated uh, Chiang Kai-shek between 1946 and 1949. What was it that allowed Ho Chi Minh between 1950 and 1954 to bring down the French in a conventional battle at Dien Bien Phu? That has never been duplicated anywhere else, as I said earlier on in the show. So this is where I really tried to look at the techniques. It's kind of political military history to try to understand what it was that allowed the, the state, the communist state, to create such modern military force. And so that's where I looked at what Lenin did, for example, uh, during the, the Civil War between 1917, oh gosh, was it 1917? Anyways, let's just say right after World War I, 1918 to 1921, I think is the dates. But one of the things that, that Lenin would do was that the creation of a communist state goes together with the mobilization for war. And he also, Lenin, came up with types of techniques that the Communist Party would use in order to mobilize people for war. And so I looked at those techniques and this marriage between how war creates states uh, when, I, when I studied the, the, the Indochina War. So what are some of the things? What is in this recipe, this toolbox of war communism, to answer your question, that's coming from Lenin? Um, I think there's um, there's a certain number of things that are that are important to underline. One is um, obviously propaganda, no doubt about that. Secondly, there's the special techniques uh, called patriotic emulation campaigns, competition uh, that are organized. Uh, third, the cult of personality. These are all ways that the leaders and the party uses to politicize the population. Um, I don't want to go off on a tangent too far here. Uh, another one would be would be land reform. And this is where Mao added something very unique to the war communism uh, toolbox was uh, the idea is that the Communist Party will use the army, the police services to go into the countryside and to overthrow the so-called feudalist class, the owners, the the, the the property owners, in order to take the land in hand, give it to the peasants as a way of mobilizing them for war, but also as a way of politicizing them and organizing them under the control of the state. Now, this might be a, a point at which some of our viewers are saying, well, that sounds like, you know, kind of heavy duty communist stuff. This is one of the things that I discovered is that the communists did indeed use these techniques. Uh, Stalin used them as well during World War II, <laughs> but they used these techniques, they're called mass mobilization techniques, what I call war communism, to go into the population to control them, to use them to create huge teams. If you remember in my book, I talk about the huge logistical teams because they didn't have trucks. Well, if trucks aren't there, that means you have to go into the villages in order to, to get people to lug ammunition, food, that sort of thing uh, to do it. And this is what we don't see in other wars of decolonization, this capacity to mobilize people in massive uh, numbers. Um, and, and so I'm not doing the best job here of answering your question, but it's these techniques that I explored. So cult of personality, propaganda, uh, emulation campaigns, uh, uh, land reform is very important. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to go and mobilize the population to recruit them for the army. Uh, rectification. I'm sorry. I was looking there a moment ago. Rectification. I, I know some people will object to this term, but the thing is, is that the Chinese used it and Ho Chi Minh used it as well. Uh, this idea of changing bureaucrats and, and soldiers, their way of thinking so that you can better control them. Um, that's a long answer. It wasn't my best answer, but it's this idea 
of a, a kind of a, a what I call the war communist toolbox. And it's a unique form of warfare that you only find in Vietnam, China, North Korea, and the Soviet Union. Yeah. So um, your road is your, your road. Your, <laughs> your, your book is called The Road to Dien Bien Phu. And of course, we're talking with Christopher Gosha. Um, and and I, we should talk in our in our last few yeah. minutes here about yeah. Dien Bien Phu. And, 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 you know, it's the last of eight conventional battles that the Vietnamese yeah. fight against the French. And I want to read a quote. Uh, this is a, a, a terif terrifying battle, which you describe mm. as almost being more out of World War One than, yes. than anything else. Yes. Uh, and this is from, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Nguyen Nu, mm -hmm. uh, a quote from him uh, talking about the battle. And he said, I could see the bodies of our dead strung all over the ground at the mercy of enemy projectiles. I couldn't hold back my tears at the scene of such violence, at the brutality of the battlefield. The evacuation became increasingly difficult be because we had a limited number of porters. We waited for the rare moment of calm when we could receive our comrades on the hill. I lived among the dead. Many had to wait for days until we could bring them to the lines at the rear. Often their bodies were no longer intact. Many couldn't be identified for we hadn't even had the time to take down the name, age, or origin of these new recruits. Yeah. And there are others who stayed on this hill forever as we never succeeded in recovering their bodies. And and this is such a universal quote, which could yes. be from World War II or World War I or the Civil War. W w give us a sense of this this battle in which the French are, are surrounded by and eventually overrun by yeah. um, 50,000 uh, Vietnamese forces or some That's huge right. number of... No, Vietnamese. no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the battle shapes up in, in late 1953, uh, and it'll run obviously until the end of the, the battle um, on the 7th of May, 1954. It takes place as, um, I don't know if you have your map there with the spot of Dien Bien Phu, if you might want to bring it up, but in northwestern Vietnam, um, the Vietnamese, you know, they didn't want to fight any more of these conventional battles uh, near Hanoi, near the French air bases. Uh, near the French warships. Um, uh, so they started to move to the Northwest in 1953, hoping that the French would would take up the the, the battle uh, with them there. I won't go into the details, but um, Navarre, who is the, the, the French commander of uh, Indochinese, uh, the French forces in Indochina, he accepts the battle in Dien Bien Phu. Basically, it's, it's a valley. I was there in 2019, and if any of our viewers have the chance to go, you really should go. Uh, because you, you you're in the valley and then you look up and you can see the hills but you can see that these hills are, are miles off there yeah so that's the valley you know the bunkers there where the, the french were and there was a five or six or seven i can't quite remember that were you know the along the perimeter uh, protecting the the french uh, fortress here in the the city of uh, dien bien phu it was a small city a, a thai village uh, which would be totally obliterated by the battle uh, by the end of it but um yeah so you have about during the whole battle, that period from November until uh, May of 1954, you're going to have about 14,000 French troops. When I say French troops, yes, there were French there, but it's perhaps important to mention that you also have Vietnamese troops fighting. You have uh, African troops. You have French Foreign Legion troops. So you have a real imperial army uh, that's fighting here, which won't be the case uh, uh, during the Algerian War. So, um, so you can see they're in the trenches here. So they're they're already in battle here. I don't know which wave attack it is, but they've been surrounded now in the surrounding kind of mountain hills, mountains. They're 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 quite you know they're they're important and they're not they're, they're not the Rocky Mountains, but they're certainly uh, cam uh, jungle covered uh, hills where the Vietnamese have uh, brought in their troops. So you have uh, four divisions you know that are there in all. Not all of the divisions are there completely, but you have in all about fifty thousand to sixty thousand troops. That are surrounding them. The Vietnamese are bringing in. If you can, if you see Dien Bien Phu, it's not too far from uh, the Chinese border. So oh, the this is the battle Sorry. that they wanted to fight. This is the battle that they could use here. So they're bringing in the artillery. They do have trucks now by this time, uh, Chris and Rick, which is important. They do have trucks, but nonetheless, the trucks can only get so far, and then people power is still important. So they have to mobilize again, two hundred fifty thousand porters uh, for this uh, battle. 
uh, here you have the troops. You can see this is a professional army here. And you can see that you have the artillery, which is, I'm assuming, softening up the, the French positions <coughs> as they as they attack here. Um, so this is a conventional battle. You, you cannot. This is, an, this, this, this is two elephants that want to fight each other. Uh, the tiger is no longer, you know, uh, it's, it's become an elephant. This is a, this is something that we just don't see anywhere else. Um, so you're going to get something similar to Verdun, you know, and that's what, um, that's what some of the French officers who had indeed been at, uh, you know, at, in battle and in World War One, they had seen this, um, the, the, the Vietnamese are going to spin a web of, uh, of trenches uh, around the fortress and they have to go over the top just like they had to do during world war one and they will run into heavy machine gun fire they're gonna the artillery as well the vietnamese are using their artillery to bomb the fortress uh and so they're you know the 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 force the violence is shared which is quite unique again in this uh, this war of decolonization um there's a three waves in all i won't go into details but the battle itself begins on the 13th of march uh there's rain. It's it's really bad conditions. Um, it's it's it's. I don't think we'd be accurate to say that it, this was no pushover. This was a brutal battle. Uh, Jap admits it in his memoirs. There 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 was troops who didn't want to go over the top, um, but, but they did. You know they did. And the, the third the third wave occurred. But you can see this was this was a brutal battle in order to bring down the French. Uh, you know, for the first time since they lost in Quebec, you know, <laughs> in, in, wow. in the seventh uh, colonial wars. What I mean, a colonial war. So this is this is a big, big uh, second colonial defeat that they suffered here on the seventh of uh, May, nineteen fifty-four. So I, I guess you know, we, you know, we're, we're paving the way for your for your next book about the second Indochina War, yep. but. Um, <laughs> They, they win this this is a very decisive battle and it yep. leads to French withdrawal and you would think that given a victory like that done and dusted Vietnam gets its independence so they win the battle but you could say they lose the war or the war is going to continue what happens yeah. that, that doesn't make this as conclusive a result yeah as maybe it should have been yeah well the answer is the Americans. Americans who don't seem to be paying a lot of attention to how effective the Vietnamese are here. That may be true. I I, I agree with that. I, although I would like to know more about what the Americans actually knew, because they were they were involved. I would like to know what the American intelligence services were really saying. It would be interesting to know. And of course, if they're saying, you know, we should be careful about going to war against these guys, and then if they weren't listened to, then that in itself is significant. You know what I mean? That's that's, that's right. hubris, of course. Um, but yeah, I think um, the, the the Vietnamese did indeed think that they were going to get all of Vietnam for this, but it was complicated for two reasons, I would say, is that the, the Chinese and the Soviets in 1953 and 54, as you know, the Korean War had, had reached a ceasefire in July of 1953. Um, the Chinese and the Soviets were looking for a little bit, you know, Stalin died in what, of March of 1953 as well. So there's this moment where the communist bloc is perhaps not 100 percent behind Ho Chi Minh. And they're saying we need to take a break here. These two wars in Asia have been the most violent wars of the Cold War, which is true, which is true. And they would remain so at least Vietnam would until the end of the Cold War. Um, and they they did caution ho why don't we take a break why don't we see if we can do a political deal here the french want out it is true that the americans want in if if we don't do a political deal at geneva i'm, I'm kind of summing up here and the americans were threatening as you know and i think many of our viewers know to intervene you know they were taking this very seriously uh they were watching closely what was going on at dmv and Fu. so I think I think the the new sources in Vietnam show that they were not ready to see the French go only to take on the Americans right away in 1954. They they weren't ready. I mean, we 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 know that the Americans are going to wait until say, I don't know, 1964, 1965, right? But had the Vietnamese not signed the Geneva ceasefire agreement, uh, there was a risk that, that it could have it could have blown up into a bigger war. Right. Because already we know Eisenhower was he had thought about going to war 
in Indochina in 1954 during the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. He did not do it. I'm not saying that. But for Ho Chi Minh, the Chinese, the, the Soviets, we should be careful. The other factor which is important, and I, I try to show this in my book, is this war communism, which I didn't quite explain so well, but this war communism. Uh, Did, it was a great exhausted. explanation. Obviously. It exhausted. It exhausted the Vietnamese people. Mm. I think Ho Chi Minh ran the risk of bringing down the house on him if he didn't mm. stop the war in 1954. Just to get back really quickly, that, that war communism. Don't forget that he started land reform during the Battle of the Indian Food. The two things were linked. That's one of the big things I tried to show in the book is this is no accident. He's trying to do what Mao did. He's he's mobilizing. He's throwing everything he can at this battle. He won it, but I think at the end of it, he knew that if he pushed his people any further, there could be revolts. There could be just exhaustion. It, it won't work. So so he ends up, and, and of course, we, we sort of know the story. He ends up they sign mm -hmm. a, a, a deal at Geneva and Vietnam ends up getting split into two yep, rather than having right. a vote. And then eventually the United States gets back involved. Christopher, before I let you, Chris, before I let you go, two very quick questions. Uh, one, one line answer. Uh, did yep. any of the French troops survive? Yes, yes. They got marched off to POW camps. And did they get repatriated eventually? They did. And Many, sec yep, mm, yep oh, go. sorry, so nope. short, short answers. Yep. <laughs> second right, yep. question. Uh, I know you've written a history of Vietnam, but do you have another book planned about the war after this war? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, I'm doing a one on the, the histories of the Vietnam War from uh, brace yourself from the from the Mongols to the present. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. So okay. a small project, a small okay, project. Good, good, good. So, so, <laughs> so uh, d d dastardly American deeds can only be a very small part of that book. Chris, Chris Don't worry, Gosha. I'll get to them. I'll get to them. <laughs> Chris Gosha, thank you so much for joining you, us. Uh, so great, much. great to talk to you. Great explanations of such a super complicated topic. We were talking today to Christopher Gosha, author of The Road to Dien Bien Phu. Uh, and he is, of course, an amazing and highly renowned scholar. He's the man when it comes to this topic, and we appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You, Thank you. I enjoyed it greatly. Thank you, guys. Excellent. Uh, yeah, we got a lot of positive feedback on that uh, from people, and I, he's just a terrific, uh, terrific person to talk to. I could have gone into hour two easily. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that, that might have there might have been another revolution. <laughs> that would have been a good point, Rick. That would have been a good point. At that point. point, you don't think I was overly needy there, do you? Just, just a little bit. Just you know, the right amount of needy, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, next week, Chris. Yes, next week. One of our favorites, and we do have favorites. We do. We do. But next week, uh, we're going to talk to. Craig Simons. Craig Simons, yes. And we're going to talk about Nimitz at war. Admiral Nimitz, of course, who commanded the uh, American Navy in the Pacific. And uh, and Craig's got a new book on that. Craig is, is, is this will be his third time, I think, on the show. I so he's, he's itching up to that hat. Yeah. He's, he's, he's on the road. He does not even know it. But he's on the road <laughs> to getting that hat. Don't forget that you can get your History Happy Hour hat, which we showed at the top. If you joined us late, you missed seeing the incredible, awesome picture of our New or we could be happy to show you again. But you have to become a, a top shelf sponsor on Patreon at patreon.com slash history happy hour. And Chris, a reminder that all our programs are archived on YouTube and that you can listen to episodes on the History Happy Hour podcast. Hooray! Available, you know, wherever good places, podcasts are found. corners yeah. where you keep your podcasts. Okay. We're, now th we're now three minutes over. The audience has got to be dropping like flies. So I think <laughs> it's time for us to wrap it up. Uh, thanks, safe. everybody, for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you.